Hi, this is Guy. I've been doing pest control for many years now, and I have been licensed in several states. Well, I'm not licensed anymore because I'm retired now, but given that many people need to save money these days, I decided that I would share ways that I learned over the years on how you can do your own pest control effectively, safely, and most importantly, inexpensively. My goal is to save people money. So if you find this video helpful, please share it with someone you know who could also stand to save a buck on pest control. Also, if you would like to see more of my videos, then please click the subscribe button and don't for forget to click that little bell next to it so that you will get notified when I have another video published. Now, if you really like what I do, please show me a little love and click on that like button. Okay, today we are going to talk about treating a dry wood termite infestation yourself. Now, if you are familiar with my videos, then you know that they are typically not short. But I am thorough, and I intend to be thorough in this video as well, because I want to make sure that you have all the information you need to do the job right. Before I get into the treatment, I should advise you that this is not a guaranteed way to eliminate a dry wood termite infestation. While this is the type of treatment that most pest controllers will do, even the best pest controllers can miss dry wood termite galleries. So please, do not beat yourself up if you happen to miss a gallery as well. The good news is that if you do miss a gallery, you can easily treat it later on. Just to be clear though, the only guaranteed way that I know of to totally eliminate dry wood termites is to tent the entire building and fumigate it with a gas. Okay, if you want to tackle this problem yourself, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you actually do have dry wood termites and you need to find out where they're located. Most people discover the problem because they find dry wood swarmers laying around or the wings from those swarmers. Swarmers are a reddish color and they have four wings of equal length. If you are seeing live or dead swarmers or their wings laying around, then you most likely do have a dry wood termite infestation. Now, dry wood termites are typically only found in certain areas of the United States. So take a look at this map. If you are not in the red area on the map, then you probably do not have dry wood termites. The other way to tell is to do an inspection. Now there are several ways that you can do the inspection. But the reason that even the pros miss galleries is because there is no sure fire way that, that you can do an inspection that will guarantee that you will catch every problem area. So all that you can do is, well, just, just do your best. So let's start with the obvious stuff. We all know that dry wood termites create kick out holes in the drywall. We also know that you will generally find frass directly below these kick out holes. Kick out holes are tiny holes that look like this. And frass looks a bit like sawdust and it kind of looks like this. So a good place to start 
is to look for frass and those tiny kick-out holes in all your walls, woodwork, cabinets, furniture, and so forth that are inside the building. Also, you should go into the attic and look for those kick-out holes and frass in those areas as well. Oftentimes, drywood termites will enter through penetrations in the soffits and the infestation will start in the attic. If you happen to have a basement or crawl space, then you should also check those areas as well. Another obvious sign of termites is if you see wall damage, such as painted wall surfaces that appear to be water damaged, or drywall that is bubbling up, bulging, or looks to be caving in. Woodwork may appear to be cracked or sunken in, and again, you may see those kick out holes in frass. Also, don't forget to look at the ceilings and floors too. If you see ceilings that are starting to come down, or if you see bubbling, caving in, you know, that sort of thing, this could be termites. And naturally, if your floors are soft, craving in, or you have holes, that, that kind of thing, this could be termites. If you see these signs of an infestation, then it might not be a bad idea to treat these areas first. Now, just because you don't see any of these signs of termites does not mean that you do not have a dry wood termite infestation in your walls. Like I said, dry wood termites often enter through openings in the soffits and they can find their way into your wall studs through penetrations that were made during the building process. The problem is, how do you tell if you have dry wood termites in wall studs that are covered up by the drywall? Well, there is equipment available that can scan your walls to detect dry wood termites that are in the wall studs, but this equipment is fairly expensive. So it's not really an option for homeowners. And let me tell you, most pest controllers are not going to spend the money to buy it either. And there's more than one pest controller out there that probably doesn't even know that it exists. So what most pest controllers are going to do is they're simply going to tap on the wall over where the wall studs are you know, with something like a rubber mallet, golf club, that sort of thing. And they're going to listen for hollow sounds in the wall or, you know, the sound of that frass falling down through the wall voids. As you can imagine, this is far from a sure way to detect dry wood termites. Nevertheless, this is fairly easy to do yourself. Most pest controllers will just start tapping away with, with that rubber mallet or golf club or you know the, the handle of a hammer or something like that. But I would suggest that you use a method that is just a little bit more involved than that. The professionals can get away with it because They've been doing this a long time, and they know exactly what they were doing. So, they may scoff a bit at what I'm going to suggest to you. But I think my, recommend my recommended procedure is probably going to work best for folks who are not professional pest controllers. So what I recommend is that you get yourself a stud finder and locate all the studs in all the walls throughout the house. You can purchase a stud finder from Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, any place like that, and they're fairly inexpensive. Just place the stud finder on the wall 
Squeeze the buttons and let it calibrate itself. Then all you need to do is drag the stud finder horizontally across the wall until it indicates that you found a stud and then just make a pencil mark on the wall where the stud is. Next, just hammer in a four penny finishing nail where the stud is near the ceiling and hang a weighted string on the nail about two inches above the baseboard. This will show you where the stud is. Now, just tap on the wall with a rubber mallet or something like that and pause between taps and listen for frass falling. Next, start tapping on the wall over the string with the back of a screwdriver and listen for different sounds in the wall. Drywood termites make hollow spaces in the wall where the galleries are and that is going to create a different sound than areas where there is not galleries and the 2x4 is solid. When termite galleries are created, they create a hollow space in the wall stud. When you tap on a hollow space in, in the wall stud, it's going to have a slightly different sound than a stud that has not been hollowed out. Needless to say, if the gallery is small enough, then you may not hear any differences in the sound at all, and it may be too small to cause enough frass to fall so you're not going to be able to hear it. Nevertheless, there still could be a gallery there. That is the reason why so many professionals may also miss galleries in your walls. Now while you have that string up, you should also take a, a screwdriver and try to push it up and down the wall, down the entire length of the stud, about every four inches. If the wall feels soft or you know if the screwdriver pokes right through the drywall then you could well be looking at a termite gallery. Another option that some pest controllers will use are inspection scopes also called endoscopes or bore scopes. These are basically cameras that you can insert into your walls and look for frass at the bottom of the wall voids. You know, that's behind the drywall. Just like before, what you do is you get a stud finder and mark the location of the studs throughout the entire house and make a small pencil mark where each stud is located. Then make a mark between the two studs and run the stud finder down the wall to look for a cross member that may be near the middle of the wall from the ceiling to the floor. Most builders run their drywall horizontally so that it is, hard, so that it is harder to see the mud joints. It is not all that common, but some builders do put a horizontal 2x4 in the wall where the joint is created so that they have nailing space between the studs. If you find a cross member, then you need to drill a hole between the studs and about 4 inches above that cross member. Just drill the hole at a downward angle and insert the inspection scope. When it gets close to the cross member, you will be able to tell if there is frass there because the light on the end of the inspection scope is going to illuminate the frass. Do the same procedure between the same studs about four inches above the floor. If there is no cross member, then you are in luck and you just need to do the inspection near the floor. Now, be sure to do this 
for all the studs in each wall of the house. To repair the holes, just get a couple of cheap broad knives and some spackling compound and you just simply fill them in. Be sure to feather them out as good as you can. Let it dry overnight and then lightly wipe it down with a damp sponge. The sponge will quickly remove any ex excess spackling compound, but be careful not to overdo it. You just want to smooth it out and feather it in around the edges. After that, just apply a second coat and again, try to feather out the edges as best you can and let it dry overnight. Like before, just take a damp sponge and smooth it out and feather in around the edges. After that, all you need to do is touch up the paint. Keep in mind that the wetter the sponge is, the faster it will, it will remove the spackling compound. So you just want the sponge damp and not wet. Also, the more pressure you apply to the sponge, the more spackling compound is going to be removed. So a light touch is definitely recommended. Of course, there are problems with using an inspection scope to look for dry wood termites. First, a somewhat decent inspection scope is going to cost you at least $100, and a really good one can cost over $2,000. Now you can get a cheaper one for under $25, but it will most likely not have sufficient light and detail to allow you to do a good job finding frass. Now, I was looking around the internet recently and Home Depot sells a Ryobi Tech 4 digital inspection scope for about $99. And that may work okay. The reviews on it are pretty good, and from what I can tell, it should have enough light and quality to do the job. The thing is, I cannot be certain though, because I do not own one. The one I happen to have was a gift for my daughter, and it's the kind that you plug into your cell phone. You can get one just like this for about $21 on Amazon. But trust me when I tell you that you do not want to waste your money like this one. The Ryobi is probably the minimum that you're going to get away with. In addition to the cost of the inspection scope, there is the little matter of needing to drill one or two holes between all the studs in the entire building. Wall studs are generally spaced 16 inches apart, and since you need to drill between all the studs, you will be drilling one to two holes every 16 inches along every wall in the entire home, and all those walls need to be repaired. Still, this is the best option if you want to figure out everywhere that you're going to need to treat. The idea is that dry wood termites must make those kickout holes to expel frass. If those kickout holes are not in the drywall, then they must be on the sides of the wall studs, which are located behind the drywall, which you cannot see. Since gravity is going to cause the frass to fall to the bottom of the wall void, then all you need to do is have a look at the bottom of the wall void to find the frass. If you see frass, then the stud on one side or the other must have at least one gallery. So you need to treat the studs on both sides of the location where you observe the frass. And I'm going to explain to you exactly how you do that treatment in just a little bit. Look, 
If you are feeling somewhat discouraged at this point, you are not alone. You can understand now why pest control companies will only give you a return visit guarantee on dry wood termite treatments. It's virtually impossible to guarantee that they can find all the galleries, even if they are using some very sophisticated equipment. Now, if you are a pest controller and you know of another way to inspect for dry wood termites behind drywall, then please share that information in the comment section. I am always eager to learn new things. And I have found that sometimes people come up with some pretty ingenious ways of doing things that I have never seen before. So please share. Okay. So what else can you do about dry wood termites in the wall studs? Well, if you want, you can just assume that all the wall studs in the entire house are infested and just go ahead and, well, treat them all. While this is time consuming, at the same time, it will pretty much ensure that you have no dry wood termite galleries in your walls. In any case, whether you treat just the studs that you think are infested, or if you decide to treat all the studs in the house, the process is exactly the same. The good news about treating studs is that the holes that you're going to need to drill through the drywall are very small. So they are easily fixed with just a little bit of spackling compound on the tip of your thumb. To treat a stud, just use that stud finder to locate all the, woods, all the wall studs and hang that weighted string from the ceiling to the floor like I already described. Then drill small holes about four inches apart and an inch and a half deep down the length of the entire stud from the ceiling to the floor. Then shoot fipronil foam into all the holes for about five seconds or until the foam either comes back out at you or until it is coming out of the other holes that you drilled. You're going to know when you hit a gallery because the foam will be coming out of at least one of the other holes that you drilled while you are applying it. Like I said, you can do this treatment for just the studs that you believe are infested, or you can do this treatment on every stud in the house. Again, this is a lot of holes to patch. But the good news is that you only need to make the holes wide enough for the applicator tip of the fipronil can to get into the hole. So about an eighth of an inch is all you're going to need. And these holes can be patched very easily with a bit of spackling compound. Like I said, a little spackling compound on the tip of your thumb, push it into the hole, and then all you need to do is wipe off the excess with a damp sponge and just touch up the paint. Now, any brand of fipronil foam will work. But I kind of, the one that I kind of like the best is the one that solutions pest and lawn cells. It's called Fipro. And I find that it's just a little cheaper than the other brands. And I really like the way they did the applicator tip as well. So I will go ahead and place a link in the description for that product so you know where to get it. Now, you also need to inspect and treat all the woodwork in your home as well. 
There is no particular order in which you need to do this. That is to say, you can start with the woodwork before you do the drywall, or vice versa. Drywall termites are fairly easy to spot in molding and other woodwork. A lot of the time, you're going to see those kickout holes in the molding along with the frass that is directly below the kickout holes. Also, as I mentioned before, you may see indentations in the wood or you may see cracking and discoloration or that sort of thing. If you see any of that stuff, then that is a good place to start your inspection. But you should also inspect all the molding and woodwork throughout the entire building. To do this inspection, take a screwdriver and try to push it through the wood about every four, in four inches around all the molding in the entire building. If the wood feels soft or if the screwdriver goes right through, then most likely you have found a dry wood termite gallery. Woodwork is very easy to treat. Just drill holes that are about four inches apart and about one quarter of an inch deep. The holes, again, only need to be wide enough for the fipronil foam applicator tip to get in. Then do the same thing that you did with the drywall. Shoot the foam into each hole for about five seconds or until it comes back out at you or until you see it coming out of the other holes that you drilled. Repairing the holes is simple. If the woodwork is painted, just get some paintable wood caulk and press some into the hole with your thumb and wipe off the excess. Then all you need to do is paint. If the woodwork is stained, get some colored wood filler that matches the stain and again, press it in with the tip of your thumb and wipe off the excess. It is very common to find dry wood termite galleries in woodwork that is around windows and doors. And that's because the termites most likely entered from the outside of the building around those affected windows and doors. If this is the case, then be sure to also treat the molding that is on the outside of the building around those affected windows and doors. This treatment should be done the exact same way that you did for the interior woodwork. Now let's talk about how to treat your cabinets. Naturally, if you were seeing kickout holes on the exterior of the cabinet, you would not want to be drilling holes all, all over the place on the exterior of the cabinet because it's not going to look too good. However, you can drill holes on the inside of the cabinet where nobody's going to see them. Now, cabinets are generally constructive of fairly thin materials. Therefore, if you are drilling holes on the inside of the cabinet, you want to make sure that you do not drill the hole so deep that they come out the other side of the cabinet. Typically, all you need to do is drill a very shallow hole that may only need to be about an eighth of an inch deep. Just like with the woodwork, you want to drill these holes about every four inches apart in the infested areas. Again, just like the woodwork, you want to shoot fipronil foam into each hole until it's either coming back out at you or until it's coming out the other holes that you drilled. On the exterior of those cabinets, you should shoot the foam into any kickout holes that you happen to see on the exterior of the cabinet. Also, just like you would do on stained woodwork, 
Try to find a wood filler or wood putty that is sim a, you know, a similar match to the finish on the cabinet and simply fill in the holes by putting a little on the tip of your thumb and pressing it into the holes and then simply wipe off the excess. It is also common to find dry wood termites in your furniture. So check all your wood furniture for kick out holes and frass. Keep in mind that it is very possible to find dry wood termites in upholstered furniture too, because oftentimes manufacturers use wood to form the basic structure of the couches, recliners, and so forth. Of course, it is not practical to remove the fabric from upholstered furniture. So just turn the furniture over and inspect whatever wood is visible and check to see if there is frass on the floor. To treat wooden furniture, you simply shoot the fipronil foam into any kick out holes that you find. If you have dry wood termites in upholstered furniture, well, that is much more problematic. A lot of the time, the wood may be covered by fabric, so exposing the wood, exposing the wood may seriously damage or destroy that piece of furniture. So, as much as I hate to say this, if it were me, I would just replace that piece of furniture and just throw it away. Of course, if for some reason you cannot replace that piece of upholstered furniture, you know, because perhaps it's a fairly heirloom or it's a very expensive antique, something like that, then I'm not sure how I should advise you on that. Because the truth is that I have never run into that situation. However, if I did encounter that situation, then I guess my first thought would be to contact a company that does fumigations and see if they would be able to treat that one piece of furniture. Again, this is something I've never run into myself, but I think it is possible. Of course, chances are you're going to need to bring that piece of furniture to the company to do the treatment. I suppose it's just the sort of thing that you're going to just need to ask about. Next, you need to do a borer care treatment on all exposed wood in the attic, crawl space, basement, exterior wood decks, and on any other place where there is exposed untreated wood. Please note that you cannot treat wood that has been painted or has some, or some other sort of finish on it, like stain, shellac, polyurethane, or anything like that. Always mix the boric hair one to one with water. The label says that you can mix it one to five. But that is best for a preventative treatment. For an active dry wood termite infestation, you must mix it one to one. And since you don't know for sure where the termites are, then I think it's best to simply assume that all the exposed wood has been infested. That way, you leave no stone unturned. And let's face it, you don't want to find out later that you missed a gallery and you allowed these things to do a lot of damage that could have been easily prevented. Also, since boar care is permanent, if you treat all the wood, 
then you are never going to get another infestation in the wood you treated. Now, the best way to apply Boracare is with a cheap garden sprayer. You can apply it with a brush or a roller, but a garden sprayer is way faster. The thing is, though, that you should never mix Boracare in a garden sprayer. Always mix it in a five gallon bucket. Start by pouring half a gallon of water into a five gallon bucket and then pour in the entire gallon of Boracare. The Boracare is very thick. So to get it all out of the container, you should fill the empty container about a quarter of the way with water and shake it up really good. Then pour that into the five gallon bucket and then repeat that rinse procedure. Since you started with a half gallon of water in the bucket and you added one gallon of Boracare, you had a gallon and a half in the bucket when you started to rinse the Boracare container. Since you filled the container a quarter of the way to rinse it, that means you, you rinsed it with one quarter of a gallon two times. That procedure added another half gallon to the bucket, leaving you with two gallons of finished product. Now that you have a gallon of water and a gallon of Boracare in the bucket, you need to mix it with a drill and a paint mixer attachment like this one. Mix the Boracare until there is no resistance on the drill and the solution has the consistency of water. Now, a lot of folks will tell you that you need to mix Boracare with hot water. But the truth is, cold water works just fine. If you like, you can also add a dye to the mix to make it easier to see where you've applied it. Simply follow the directions on the dye, the dye container. Okay, now that the Boracare is properly mixed, you can pour it into a cheap garden sprayer. I never use an expensive garden sprayer for bore care because the product can easily clog a sprayer. And if you use a dye, the color can be somewhat difficult to rinse out of the sprayer as well. After treating for the day, be sure to thoroughly rinse out the sprayer or there is a good chance that it's going to clog. Personally, I generally just throw away the sprayer after finishing a Boracare job because a cheap sprayer on Amazon only runs about $10. Now, Boracare is very safe to use. Nevertheless, you should wear a respirator if you're working in a confined area like the attic or a crawl space. It is important that you treat all exposed wood in the attic, the crawl space, basement, exterior wood decks, and any other places where there is exposed untreated wood. But you cannot treat wood that has been painted or has some other sort of finish on it, like stained shellac or polyurethane. If you are treating an outside area, like a wooden deck, do not apply the Boracare within 48 hours of rain or snow. So be sure to get a weather report before you're doing the work. If you want to make sure that you have uh, a good job, always have a, at least two days, and I recommend three you know, dry days ahead of you before you start the treatment. 
after applying the Boracare, that's on the outside, you're going to need to put a finish on the treated wood within six weeks after the application, but no sooner than 48 hours after the application. That's to say, you need to let it dry for at least 48 hours before you paint or stain or finish it in any way. And that's why you need those two or three dry days. To do a Boracare treatment correctly, you need to treat the roof rafters that are in the attic and the floor joists in the crawl space or basement. You also need to, tre need to treat the roof sheathing and the subfloor that is in the basement or crawl space. And you need to treat between the rafters and between the floor joists. Since termites will attack anything that is made of wood, you have to treat it all. That means that in the basement or crawl space, you may need to remove the insulation from under the floor in order to get to the subfloor. Again, this is a big reason why the pros oftentimes do not want to do a Boracare treatment. Removing and replacing the insulation is a time-consuming and nasty job. In the attic, you need, to make, you need to make sure that you treat both sides of the ceiling joists. Since there is generally insulation between the joists, you need to take a stick or something and try to move the insulation to one side so that you expose the side of the floor joist so that you can treat it properly. Of course, this is uh, often easier said than done. So just do the best that you can. Finally, in the attic, you must spray inside the soffits. This is especially important since this is most likely where the dry wood termites are going to enter the building if they get into the attic. After you finish treating, then it's important to prevent future infestations. Yes, you did do a permanent treatment in the attic, but it is still possible that you missed something. And it is possible that dry wood termites may enter again through cracks and crevices around windows, doors, pipe penetrations, and so forth. So what you need to do is an exterior treatment every three months with a good quality pesticide. I like to treat with Taurus SC because it's a termiticide. The thing is though, that it can only be used every six months but it does not last six months. So, what you need to do is an in-between treatment with something like Talstar P or a similar pesticide. I will place a link in the description where you can purchase all of the products that I mentioned in this video. Now, the good news is that if you do this exterior treatment every three months, then not only will you prevent future dry wood termite infestations, but you will also prevent all sorts of other pests from infesting your home as well. This treatment's gonna prevent ants, American cockroaches, spiders, and pretty much any other creepy crawly bug that is trying to get into your house. Not only that, it will prevent wasps from building nests in your eaves, and it may even prevent, or let's say not prevent, huh, I'm overstating it, 
It may help to prevent subterranean termites as well if you are spraying between the wall of the house and the ground. If you soak that area between the wall and the ground really well, that may also help to stop subterranean termites. Now, in the interest of time, because I know this video has been long already, I have created a separate video on how to do a proper exterior treatment on your home that is going to prevent dry wood termites and all those other pests that I mentioned. And I will place a link in the description and at the end of this video to make it easy for you. Okay, that's it for me today. I'm sorry that this took so long, but I cannot show you how to treat for dry wood termites in five minutes. Anyway, if you found this video to be of assistance to you in any way, please share it with a friend or family member. And if you would like to see more of my videos, then please click the subscribe button and don't forget to click on that little bell next to it so that you will get notified when I have another video posted. Now, if you really like this video, then please show me a little love and click on that like button. Until next time, thank you so much for watching and please do not hesitate to ask questions. I will answer any question about any pest for anybody, anytime, for free, even if I do not have a video on the particular pest in question. I am always here to help.